The circus is coming to town. Advanced men plastered colorful posters on barn doors, billboards, and store walls, enticing all ages to join in the magic that was to come. At dawn, roustabouts and elephants transformed a dusty field into a magnificent tent city. Later, down the center of Main Street, fancy plumed horses pulled golden wagons filled with roaring lions, painted clowns, and glittering aerialists. Steam calliopes led the crowd back to the midway for rides, popcorn, and peanuts. A hard-earned nickel bought a glimpse of snake charmers, or Hindu sword swallowers. And finally, the show of shows in the center ring. For over 100 years, the circus has brought dazzling wonder to the heart of America. This exhibit captured the history and magic of the greatest show on earth. Children today can hardly comprehend the excitement generated when the circus came to town. It was a glittering festival, a rite of passage. Moving primarily by rail after the 1880s, shows would eventually travel 15,000 miles, crisscross 30 states, and perform in over 150 towns during an eight-month season. Today, the two Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey trains, with 57 cars stretching nearly a mile, reach about 115 towns each year. Bandwagons trumpeted the arrival of the majestic pachyderms as they shuffled trunk to tail down Main Street. Billy goats lugged the clown carts, and lastly, the steam calliope led townspeople to the showgrounds. Coated with gold or silver leaf, the highly carved wagons featured American arts, crafts, nursery rhymes, and landscapes, as well as the history and legends of the 19th century. But the parades died away. The Great Depression forced cutbacks, and by 1939, urban sprawl had pushed the show lots far from Main Street. In 1963, a revival of the old-time street parade rolled through downtown Milwaukee. Produced by the Circus World Museum, the Great Circus Parade became an annual event. Now it's reenacted in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Street parades often announce their arrival with that most familiar of all circus music, the entry of the gladiators, also called Thunder and Blazes. It's a tune that everyone recognizes, but few know its name. Bands played everything from marches to waltzes and circus gallops, with the band masters writing or choosing music to suit the rhythm of the circus acts. Portions of over 200 songs filled each performance that was directed by legendary conductor Merle Evans. He toured with the greatest show on earth for nearly 50 years. His favorite composer was Iowa's adopted son, Carl King, who had been bandmaster for many circuses, including the Sells Floto Buffalo Bill Wild West combined shows and the Barnum and Bailey. Harry, 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 step right up, try your luck, test your skill. Barkers called as they lured the crowd to the game booths. Tents were draped with banners of jungle scenes and filled with the smells of sawdust and exotic animals. Enticing to all ages and classes were snake charmers, sword swallowers, giants, and dwarfs. In the 19th century, P.T. Barnum capitalized on this fascination, searching for all that is monstrous, scaly, strange, and queer. Some human oddities were made freaks, like the tattooed man but others suffered from genetic deformities or misunderstood disorders. Anything abnormal was exploited. Physical disfigurement, mental retardation, race, creed, or color. Some rarities and sideshow stars were able to amass a fortune. For others, joining the circus offered employment and companionship not found elsewhere. Charles S. Stratton began life in 1838 as a husky infant at nine pounds, two ounces. At the age of five months, the 25-inch tall 15-pound baby stopped growing. Nearly five years later, his parents met with showman P.T. Barnum. Barnum was captivated by the impish, gleeful child who gloried in his miniature size. General Tom Thumb became a national celebrity, the toast of society in America and Europe. Thumb was not a circus performer in his early years. His engagements were more vaudevillian with props, costumes, song and dance routines, and solo renditions of famous historical characters. 
Throughout his teens, Tom remained 25 inches tall, but in his 20s, he gained height and weight. No longer a cute mite, the 36-inch tall adult still charmed audiences with witty performances and continued to make appearances with his wife after his 1862 marriage to Mercy Lavinia Warren Bump, a fellow little person. The couple joined Barnum's Circus in 1881. Two years later, at age 46, Tom Thumb died of a stroke. Over 10,000 people attended his funeral. Many traditional parade and midway exhibitions found their way to star performances under the big top. For example, horse teams, little people, clowns, stilt walkers, and human cannonballs often performed their acts both outside and inside the show tents. Depending upon the height and distance needed for their stunts, human cannonballs would entertain the crowds outside near the midway. Human cannonballs have been shot as far as 85 feet and traveled over 65 miles per hour. In the early days of a circus, man's most trusted form of transportation was the star of the show. A horse's speed up to 40 miles an hour, stamina and strength, brought them into the early spotlight. More than half the circus acts in 1880s featured horses. Even today, a circus isn't a circus without horses. The hum of eager anticipation builds under a massive tent as clowns flirt with the ladies and perform magic tricks for the children awaiting the big show. The ringmaster opens the show with... Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages! Often wearing a red coat with tails and top hat and black boots, his job is to reawaken that childlike capacity for wonder and coax the audience away from everyday cares by directing their attention towards the spotlights. To close the show, the ringmaster blesses the audience with those magical words, May all your days be circus days! The centerpiece for this exhibit was a miniature big top built by Bill Clameris of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Every 4th of July weekend for the past 30 years, Bill has set up this handmade circus in his two-car garage. Bill's uncle gave him his first circus wagon when he was six, and by the time he was age 10, he was crafting his own wagons out of old orange crates. Tiny details abound, for instance. Each and every wheel contains over 70 parts. The hubs and spokes were made from golf tees. This miniature circus, representing the golden age of the traveling circus from 1890 to 1920, is one of two created by Clamaris. For thousands of years, jugglers, acrobats, and animal acts have thrilled early audiences from Egypt to China. The modern circus had its start in 1770s England, when cavalryman Philip Astley performed trick-riding stunts from the back of a horse. In America, the few public amusements available at that time were religious meetings, political speeches, and hangings. Then, in 1782, John Bill Ricketts began an English-style riding school in Philadelphia. His grand opening show excited a huge audience that included George Washington. In 1815, the first large round tent was pitched for a performance. By the 1870s, the uniquely American circus emerged from a blend of Eastern arena entertainment and the Wild West shows of Buffalo Bill. The competition between circus troops in the 1870s was fierce between Adam Forepaw, Yankee Robinson, William C. Coop, Al Ringling, James Bailey, and P.T. Barnum. This rivalry led to bigger and bigger shows. They all wanted to pack more people into the tents to improve profits. Yet the technical aspects of tent making could only elongate the space, and people seated at the ends could not effectively see the show. Enter the Three Ring Circus in 1881. This gloriously profitable expansion brought grand spectacles to the American audience. Out of Bethel, Connecticut, came Phineas Taylor Barnum, a crafty clerk turned millionaire showman. Whether or not Barnum actually said, there's a sucker born every minute, the Prince of Humbugs hoaxed, bamboozled, shocked, and thoroughly entertained the American public. 
The year 1842 brought Barnum's American Museum to New York City, a five-story building filled with curiosities, freaks, fakes, exotic animals, and new inventions. Then he met Charles Stratton, Tom Thumb, whose popularity helped Barnum rise to the top. At great expense, in 1850, Barnum snagged Jenny Lind, the Swedish Nightingale, for an extensive American tour, which turned out to be a staggering triumph. After the New York City Museum was destroyed by fire in 1865 and again in 1868, Barnum joined William Coop and Dan Costello for a circus venture in Brooklyn. Along with flashy performances, sideshow oddities became an important element in the particularly American circus. When Barnum merged his circus with that of James A. Bailey's in the 1880s, the world would experience the greatest show on earth. After Barnum died in 1891, Bailey carried on alone for 15 years. It was 1869 in McGregor, Iowa, when six brothers experienced their first circus. Ranging in age from four to 17 years, the brothers Ringling put on their own show with a tent made of sheets, a billy goat, and a horse. 13 years later, in Baraboo, Wisconsin, the Ringling Brothers Classic and Comic Opera Company featured Al, Otto, Alf, Charles, and John in musical, comedic, and acrobatic performances. The Ringlings hit the road in the early 1880s and adjusted their individual skills to programming, advertising, and promotion, financial management, and routing. By 1890, Gus and Henry joined the family venture. Switching from wagons to railroads in 1890 brought the Ringlings to the attention of the nation. After acquiring the circus companies of Four Paw Cells and Barnum and Bailey, the Ringlings combined their assets in 1919, creating the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey's Greatest Show on Earth. Today, the circus is owned by Feld Entertainment, but the name lives on. In 1956, John Ringling North announced that the tented circus is a thing of the past and moved the Ringling Circus indoors into huge auditoriums. The circus found itself in a battle with radio, movies, and television. Even so, by the 1970s, many countries were producing new versions of the circus, such as Canada's innovative Cirque du Soleil, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey's Greatest Show on Earth is enjoying renewed interest. In addition, numerous one-ring shows have recaptured the original essence of a small circus. One example is the Big Apple Circus in New York City, where a 42-foot sawdust-covered ring features traditional performances who create spectacular shows each year. Cats include 36 species that range in size from the huge Siberian tiger to the smallest house cat. The largest big cats, tigers, lions, jaguars, leopards, possess incredible strength as well as excellent vision and hearing. Tigers have a unique pattern of stripes and they vary in color from orange to white. These fierce predators are nearing extinction in all of their habitats, from tropical rainforests to grasslands and snow-covered regions. The last sighting of a white Bengal tiger in the wild was back in 1951 in central India. Often called the king of the jungle, lions do not live in jungles but on dry African grasslands. Individually, these muscular cats are surprisingly poor hunters. Hunting in packs, the females ambush herds of wildebeest or gazelle while the males rest. Between meals, two or three days will pass while they sleep up to 20 hours a day. Gorillas and chimpanzees belong to the order of primates that include monkeys, lemurs, marmosets, gibbons, and the great apes, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, and humans. Once considered the terror of the jungle, Gorillas are shy creatures that avoid confrontation. A vegetarian from African rainforests, gorillas eat 50 pounds of plants and insects a day. Gorillas communicate by using over 25 vocalizations and can learn sign language to create simple sentences. Chimpanzees possess DNA similar to humans. Originally from Western and Central Africa, chimps are now endangered due to deforestation. 
extremely intelligent, chimps can learn complicated tasks and can communicate through a complex system of vocalization and gestures. The traditional star of the circus is the largest land mammal. Despite their bulk, elephants are tremendously agile and can run up to 25 miles per hour. Circus routines mimic the behavior of these animals in the wild. Standing on hind legs, sitting and laying down, pushing over trees with their heads, and lifting heavy objects with their trunk. Highly intelligent, these huge pachyderms can understand 40 to 50 words. An elephant's trunk has thousands of muscles and is used for smell, touch, lifting, and sucking up water to blow into its mouth for a drink. In the days of the One Ring Circus, clowns were America's first stand-up comedians. When the tents were expanded to three rings, they became speechless characters confined to exaggerated visual makeup and sight gags. Each and every clown is unique in both makeup and costume. Clowns consider their performing characters to be extensions of their own personalities, a window to their soul. Here are four main types of clowns. Today's white-faced clown, with pom-poms, great baggy trousers, and pointed hats, had their beginnings in the Italian theaters of the 16th century. Another introduction from Italy, the shrewd harlequins wore tight-legged and full-sleeved costumes with black masks, white ruffled collars, and diamond-shaped patterns. Often scruffy and red-nosed from whiskey, this clown awkwardly tries to help, but inevitably gets into more and more trouble. Using a flesh-toned base with highly exaggerated facial features, the Auguste is the most zany and flamboyant clown. Some of the most famous circus clowns of America include Felix Adler. Called King of the Clowns, Adler was from Clinton, Iowa. He worked for decades on the Ringling Circus in a droopy clown suit with padded hips and rear end, a jewel in his nose, tiny hats, and a tiny umbrella, and was followed around by a piglet. Emmett Kelly, one of the most familiar and beloved clowns in American history, the sad-faced Weary Willie, or Willie the Tramp, performed his down-on-his-luck hobo act in Europe with the Ringling Circus and in the movies. Lou Jacobs, the epitome of the Auguste-style clown, Jacobs' trademark clown face sports a rubber ball nose and bright red hair. This master clown began his career as a contortionist and entertained audiences by folding his six-foot frame into the world's tiniest car. He clowned with the Ringling Brothers Circus for over 60 years. Paul Alpert, famous little person in the Ringling Circus who performed for over 50 years. His most famous routine poked fun at the early frontier days in the Wild West Whoop-de-doo. Glenn Frosty Little, a graduate of the very first class of the Ringling Brothers Clown College, Frosty achieved the distinguished title of Master Clown. He has appeared on numerous television shows and continues to teach clowning to the next generation. Circus performers create thrills and magic. Aerialists spin and swing with perfect form. High wire artists balance 30 feet above the audience. A fire breather shoots flames 10 feet high. These master athletes have studied a variety of disciplines, including gymnastics, acrobatics sports, weight training, music, dance, pantomime, juggling, zoology, animal training, comedy, acting, and entertainment of all kinds. Performing in the circus can be dangerous work. One trapeze artist pointed out, there are many ways to get hurt. In performing, consistency is the most important. Everyone can be good sometimes, but to be consistent, it's not luck. Tragic events, although rare, have occurred in front of stunned audiences. Still, most troopers agree that performing is in their blood. The world of the circus beyond the big top is called the backyard. Off limits to the general public, the back lot was traditionally filled with wagons, now trailers, carrying everything and everyone needed to keep the show on the road. A circus is a huge operation that includes production directors, costume designers and tailors, musicians, sound and lighting crews, 
choreographers, and animal trainers. Road teams consist of public relations coordinators, finance managers, the circus ministry, laundry and food service personnel, stage and prop managers, veterinarians, animal handlers, and tent riggers. A famous and popular lion tamer, Clyde Beatty worked with the big cats from the 1920s through the early 1960s. In one of the most daring acts in circus history, Beatty mixed 40 lions and tigers of both sexes together in one ring, and also featured dangerous combinations of leopards, pumas, hyenas, and bears. He headlined with Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey, created a radio show, became a Hollywood star in adventurous film serials, and formed his own circus. Gunther Gable Williams has been called the greatest wild animal tamer of all time. This German-born trainer became an American legend in a career that spanned two decades and 12,000 performances with the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. He was famous for his patient and affectionate treatment of all circus animals, including elephants, tigers, leopards, lions, cheetahs, pumas, panthers, mountain lions, giraffes, llamas, dogs, goats, horses, and zebras. Mark Oliver Gable is the son of the late Gunther Gable Williams. Mark grew up in the Ringling Circus and is called the man who talks to animals in English and in German. He notes that tigers are lovable creatures, but they demand respect and keep my attention level up, way up. This concludes our tour of the exhibit, Under the Big Top, The Circus in America. We hope you've enjoyed the show. May all your days be circus days. Thank you.